tonight. You've never said to me, you know, w will I go back into government with Fine Gael? Will I go back into Well, would you go back into government with Fine Gael? Potentially with parties that are aligned to us. Would you go back into government with Fine Gael? Well, so there's a straight no. answer to a straight no, no, question. No, no, then when no, I ask no, you, no, would no, you go into government with Sinn Féin, no, you don't answer the question. Because you're only asked the question now because I put it to you. We also hear from the Fianna Fáil leader on Stormont, Plan B and IRA commemorations. That interview is coming up very shortly. Plus, we don't have any executive ministers at the Stormont table, but we do have two former decision makers in the studio with us. And with their business hats on, they'll join our conversation about the big decisions the sector needs today's politicians to be making. It's 20 months since the Stormont institutions collapsed. In recent weeks, both the Secretary of State and the DUP leader have hinted at progress in talks to restore devolution. But is that how Dublin sees it? I sat down with the Tornishta and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Micheál Martin, in government buildings in Dublin yesterday afternoon. Can you say that you are clear, Tornishta, in your mind as to what it is precisely that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson needs to hear from Chris Heaton Harris to allow him to say we will go back into the institutions at Stormont? Has that been spelt out for you? Well, I, I put it this way the areas of concern have been spelt out. Uh, I've spoken to Geoffrey about some of those, um, and, but it remains to be seen how specifically the British government intends to uh, respond. We haven't had sight. Of, 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 of uh, any document in relation to that. Uh, our position is that the principle of consent, uh, as provided for in the Good Friday Agreement, um, has to remain intact. Do you feel cut out of that process? Do you think that Chris Heaton Harris has included the Irish government as much as he should, or do you feel a little bit in the dark? Well, it's different to previous times when I was in government, but I think things have improved significantly since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, and uh, Chris Heaton Harris, as Secretary said, and I have had a good relationship, but it's not the same as it was in respect of the original esprit de corps of the Good Friday Agreement. If Stormont doesn't come back any time soon, and if that process of restoring the uh, devolved institutions is kicked into the long grass, there's been a lot of talk about Plan B. Can you tell me now what you think Plan B might look like? There is no specific Plan B there, and I think the, the, the use of the phrase Plan B is not, not the, the most elegant of phrases to, to, to characterise this, but let's be clear that if the institutions aren't back, that is fairly fundamental. Um, in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, and I think it will mean that the British and Irish governments will have to engage, and with the parties of Northern Ireland, in terms of the next steps. And we're very clear that we have to protect, uh, particularly strands two and three. Strand three has been going relatively well in terms of the east-west relationship and the British-Irish relationship, in terms of that, you know, the meeting of the British-Irish Council and so on, is the only strand that's working uh, at the moment. Uh, the British-Irish Intergovernmental Council has been of far more substance in the last year, to be fair. But is it fair to say that unionists need to be aware that if the democratic institutions in Northern Ireland are not restored, there will be some kind of plan B, and it will involve, necessarily, an enhanced role for the Irish government? Is that a fact? If, if the institutions are not back, that's fairly fundamental to the essence of the Good Friday Agreement. So, yeah, the two governments are going to have to engage. There's no factual sort of uh, alternative in place. Um, Joint authority isn't provided for in the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. I just want to be clear You've said that, that before, yes. Uh, be yeah. very factual about that, that's clear. Uh, but we do have interests in respect of Strand 2 in particular. But also, there are issues then in terms of how the proper working of Northern Ireland itself, because we're hearing from the other party leaders, and I heard it again today very strongly, and they've been talking to the, the civil servants in Northern Ireland. The situation is teetering in terms of the financial stability, in terms of um, the various uh, impacts on public services. Uh, and so that isn't, the centre will not hold in that respect. I would hope that the institutions will come back. Yeah, but if they uh, don't. And I'm very conscious that anything I say now might be perceived as a threat, and it's not. I'm not, I'm not speaking that vain at all. I, I, I take in good faith Geoffrey Donaldson's commitment that he wants the executive in the Assembly back. I think the Windsor Agreement was a major milestone. I think actually unionism should have claimed victory on the Windsor Agreement. Much of what they had campaigned for, the vast majority of what they campaigned for, was delivered in the Windsor Agreement. You think that was a mistake by Geoffrey I Donaldson? do. I, I think it was a missed opportunity um, because things were provided for in the Windsor Agreement that unionism was told couldn't be provided for two years ago. Well, actually, 
uh, with, with the passage of time and other issues, war in Ukraine, the, the view in Europe has changed. Um, uh, Prime Minister Sunak had a different perspective on it too. Trust developed between the UK and the EU government, and much of what was what, what was argued for was delivered. And I, I feel unionism should have claimed um, uh, you know, that that was a significant success. What about investing in Casement Park in Belfast? That new stadium is going to cost something in the region of £150 million, pounds, maybe a bit more. How much is the Irish government willing to contribute to that? We will support and fund anything that contributes um, to people coming together. Uh, and that could be more than one sports stadium. It could be a number of, 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 of sports stadiums. But the British government has a fundamental role to play in okay. respect of that stadium. Um, and it, it shouldn't, the, I don't see why people are opposing the development of casement um, uh, as such. And I've picked up some of that in recent public commentary, which I think is unhelpful. People will um, expect me to ask you about your position on coalition with Sinn Féin. There is a general election coming in Northern Ireland and there's one coming in the Republic as well. At the weekend, the former Fine Gael Minister Ivan Yates said Sinn Féin could potentially win up to 70 seats. And the question is simply, are you willing uh, to serve as Mary Lou Macdonald's Tonishta? Well, again, Ivan hasn't always got it right, you know, in respect of electoral um, uh, predictions. And I certainly don't accept uh, the kind of thinking, and I've called this out already, this election is wide open, um, and if you look at the, even if you look at the polls, which I'm not a great admirer of, because the, the polls have got it wrong spectacularly on a number of occasions, particularly in relation to Fianna Fáil, by the way. Yeah, but they do um, suggest that Sinn no, Féin will be no, in the no, mix. But I'm not. Well, uh, there'll be a number of parties in the yeah, mix. Yeah, of course. So yeah, but you can't. The question you put is just not a runner in terms of the way you put it. Yeah. It's, well, it's a valid on, question. No, it's not actually. <laughs> I mean, it's not. Sorry, not being. Well, I mean, sorry, you Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Green Party, Labour Party, Social Democrats, Sinn Féin. Yeah. You have three parties at the moment in around 20... And there's going to be a coalition at the end, and I suppose I'm asking yeah, you, but if, my if Sinn Féin is the biggest be, party... No, but no, not necessarily. See, that we walk a proportional representation in both these seats. We have problems with Sinn Féin policy. Yeah. We believe they're anti-enterprise, anti-European Union, for example, uh, and there are some... Um, you know, and also, I think they triumphalise too much... Um, uh, the, the, the violence of the past. We can talk about that uh, in a moment. No, but I, no, but, but sorry, you said in 2020. You asked me about coalition, yeah, so I'm saying yeah. to you that that's, you ruled it out in that's on the policy thing. Are you going to rule it out now? The is, I resist very strongly this sort of, and it's the media really to say, that I had this, you see, in 2016. Will you be a junior partner to Fine Gael? People are saying Fine Fáil, according to the polls, will come in in the low 30s. Well, actually, we came in at 45 seats. And it wasn't a question of playing junior partner. But you could just say yes anybody. or no to answer no, the question. No, but, but I don't, you, you guys have got to really be a bit more broader in the questions you're asking. Because this is a multi seat toil. Anything could happen. The existing government could be re-elected according to the polls. But you said, would you never, no, in 2020, no, would you, you were categorical. Put, would you are, and you're not and you're today. Not alone, but you and others don't put that question to me. That's the, the beef I have. You know, you've never said to me, you know, w w will I go back into government with Fine Gael? Will I go back into well, government, would you go back into government with Fine Gael? Potentially with parties that are aligned to Would you could. go back into government yes, with Fine Gael? Yeah. Well, so government, there's a straight no. answer to a straight no, no, question. No, no, then when no, I no, ask no, you, no, would no, you go into government with Sinn Féin? You don't answer the question. Because you only asked the question now because I put it to you. <laughs> you weren't going to ask but that question. You still have answered the question I asked no, but you originally. Because I'm going to, but the question I'm going to answer is yeah. that we're going in with parties that we're aligned to. And that we will be, you know, in terms of policy terms. So, that, so is that a no then? Is that a no? We don't believe Sinn Féin are aligned with our policies. Okay. Our policies. And, and Mary Lou Macdonald is very clear that she doesn't think yeah. Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil are aligned to her policies. She would prefer well, left-leaning partners in government if she's in a position to be in government. Depends. But it's a simple enough question. Well, it, well, would, would you serve alongside it her depends. in government? It depends on which interview that Mary Lou is engaged in, because she said different things at different times. So Mary Lou will say on one interview that she resolutely rules out Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael or others. Yeah. And then in another interview she says she won't rule out and she'll talk to people. You've talked in the past about Sinn Féin being the party that is still trying to triumphalise the IRA. Is that a major problem I, for I you? I think it is. I think it's a major issue for the country, really, and society, because we need to move out of violence and, and we need to move out of this narrative that violence was justified. And you think Sinn Féin hasn't uh, done that to they, a no, great enough extent? Not, not only haven't they, um, all of their... I mean, they attempt to rewrite history and have. I mean, I remember, like we, we've had a very successful decade of centenaries, and I spoke about that this morning, which was much more informed scholarship, for example, I think it was much more open. Sinn Féin set up its own operation 
um, to some informal organisation on O'Connell Street, or, or you know, we, 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 we're trying to rewrite their narrative of the of the of the decade of centenaries, trying to reframe history to justify the Sinn Féin position. And I, I really resist, as someone who's interested in history, that you rewrite history to suit the narrative of today. Well, less than a fortnight after you talked in September about Sinn Féin triumphalising the IRA, on September the 24th, you tweeted that you were honoured to attend and deliver the oration today at the centenary of the Renine ambush in Milltown, Mulby, in Clare. Six RIC officers were killed by the IRA in that ambush. So just to be clear, are you, are you saying Mary Lou's IRA are the bad guys, but your IRA are the good guys? Is that it? Well, I think, again, if you, I don't know, did you, did you read the speech I gave it then? I've seen the speech. Yeah. And, I mean, well, no, I, the I'm speech would be far different to the kind of speech that Sinn Féin Well, that's what you tweeted. Me. No, just have Sinn Féin. Yeah, but uh, just let me finish the point. I mean, in all of my speeches in terms of commemoration, and I don't know, have you seen my speech on the You Civil talked about the sacrifice so, you gonna, I, I, have you seen in my, that speech. Have you seen of my speech in yeah, the Civil Yeah, I War? looked at your speech no, just I'm before sorry, we did no, this interview. If you just came it now, and I'll come back to you. All of my speeches on independence, the War of Independence, which was a legitimate War of Independence in Ireland, there is a difference. The 30-year war of Sinn Féin was a war against civilians on a consistent basis. Ennis Gillen, Bloody Friday. These were bombing urban areas. Warrington, the list goes on and on and on. And my point is, I don't triumphalise violence um, at all. Uh, I do. I think the, 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 the Irish independence was a legitimate thing and independence. And I go through the, histor the history of it and I acknowledge the pain on all sides. Um, and okay. I think it's important because I do think um, for younger generations today we need to create new narratives um, around peace and reconciliation. And I think much of what has happened at Provisional IRA or, or, sorry, or Sinn Féin commemorations, commemorating the Provisional IRA, has I think injured others and has kind of, for many victims of IRA violence out there, um, I think it's caused real hurt and pain, but it's also kept going this idea that what we did was just. And I don't think bombing Enniskillen or bombing uh, in, in Bloody Friday was just. I don't think it was... But six RIC yeah. officers died in that ambush, and you talked about the sacrifice of the IRA men who were involved in that. Yeah, in, in terms of the War of Independence, I think it was a legitimate yeah. War of Independence. So, so some in people maybe in Northern Ireland at the moment don't draw the distinction that you draw and might say that that's uh, an example of hypocrisy. You must know that people yeah, would but view I, I, that in that way. But some people might, but I wouldn't See, agree, but might, I wouldn't yeah. agree with that position. Yeah, okay. uh, and I think, uh, you're talking about, I mean, back then you had a, would you agree with World War I? I wouldn't agree with World War I. I thought it was an appalling waste of young people's lives. But I do respect the right of people to commemorate it, to remember it, and to remember the lives lost. We are entitled to commemorate, just tell me please, yeah. we're entitled to commemorate and remember the lives lost uh, in the Irish War of Independence. I don't triumphalise it. Uh, I don't sort of, uh, and I look, and we have, over the decade of centenaries, we have, and I think you should acknowledge this now, uh, we have brought an approach to this which is far different to anything that went before, and is far different to how Sinn Féin deals with history and deals with its own narrative. Sinn Féin tries to rewrite history. I don't. Warts and all, I embrace our past, uh, and not all of it was good. And I say to young people, I taught history. I never taught one narrative to students. I always give all perspectives. Um, and I'm not a person who in any way, I mean, I'm very clear, we should avoid violence at all costs, uh, if we possibly can in life, because we all have only one life. And life is too short. And what happened in Northern Ireland, the more I read it, uh, Say Nothing by Patrick Radden O'Keefe, I'd invite people to read that book. The disillusionment of those who took part Provision I read people as well. They were so disillusioned at the end of their lives. Brendan Hughes and Dolores Price and all of those. And they realised as life went on, this was no glorious sort of war of, 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 of self-determination in Northern Ireland. It was sordid. Some terrible deeds were done. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be celebrated. The Tornister talking to me yesterday and we'll bring you more of that interview on Sunday Politics this weekend. Now, they arrived brandishing gifts, but could the American delegation in town have been handing out a whole lot more to boost our economy? The US Trade Envoy Joe Kennedy says the return of Stormont would mean greater investment here from major companies. In a moment, I'll be speaking to four guests with expert insights into what businesses here want from our politicians and what the economy here needs to flourish. But first, here's a reminder of a busy 48 hours of pressing the flesh. <laughs> 
part of that delegation is this guy over here, Tom DiNapoli. He runs effectively the New York State Pension Fund. He says $50 million is going to be made available for investment in companies in Northern Ireland. The Bank of America funding 600 new students to train up to get jobs in technology here, aimed at young people and adults disengaged from education. All I can say is that this is an eye-watering amount of money that they are putting on the table to support the people who need our help most. Last night, the political leaders dined with the US delegation at a building still awaiting its own comeback story, Stormont. Northern Ireland is on the verge of having full access to two huge markets, a market potential unlike many places in the world. For the US delegation, it was off to the northwest and familiar questions about politics. We hope that we come to a point quickly to be able to get that political stability. It's been a message that we've heard a number of times from, again, members of our delegation. Uh, but we were with also the um, party leaders again this morning, and um, folks are optimistic that hopefully we're, we're getting there sooner rather than later. I'm joined now by our economics and business editor, John Campbell, Selena Horshey, the president of the Londonderry Chamber, Simon Hamilton, the managing director of Confluence Consulting, and Nicola Mallon, the head of trade and devolved policy at Logistics UK. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us on the programme. Simon Hamilton, you met the American delegation over the past couple of days. It was billed as a, as a high-powered US business delegation. When it was here, we heard news of a $50 million investment in local businesses and other announcements too. Does a trip like this, in your view, actually make a difference? I, I think it does. I mean, I think, you know, perhaps we have become a little used to this sort of attention. But I think, you know, if you take a step back and, and reflect on what has actually happened over the last couple of days, we've had, you know, a president of the United States, the, the largest economy in the world, came to Belfast back in April uh, and said that he was going to personally invite business leaders to come to come to Northern Ireland to see what we had to offer, to, to, to allow them to capitalise on the, 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 the real opportunities that, that the talent, that the innovation, that the, the people here can can provide for those, those companies, and he he was good on his promise. And you know we've seen people of the caliber of you know leaders at Meta and at Google and at Bank of America, and um, you know just huge companies um, employing thousands of people around the world. We haven't have, had an awful lot of announcements about investment. No, and again, I think these things are these things are are, are typically a slow burn. You know, so I. I Recall my my time in in ministerial office when I was in the department for the economy and you know meeting companies at that time around 2016 2017 it was about three years to four years sometimes for those investments to actually realise and come out the other end of the pipeline and and start to see them investing and creating jobs here in, in Northern Ireland so you know I think we shouldn't you know this is the proverbial gift horse here you know we shouldn't be turning our nose up at that opportunity to to sell Northern Ireland's wares to showcase that talent to showcase that innovation capability that we have to showcase those those opportunities that we have to help those American companies to grow um, you know this is this is a you know, this is this is a sort of opportunity that other regions of two million people around the world would give their high teeth for Nicola Mallon, you also spent time, of course, as a minister in the Stormont Executive. Do, do you see things the same way? Or do you think because we don't have a devolved administration working at the moment, we have missed a trick? Well, I think that having economic envoys to Northern Ireland is a great thing. Um, one of the things that the Northern Ireland Brexit Business Working Group, for example, has been calling for is a EU, EU economic envoy, and Kirsty McManus of the IOD has been driving that. But we also can't sit back and just be passive. We need to go out on the front foot and we need to be selling the very enviable and unique position that Northern Ireland is in in terms of having dual market access. Now, to do that, we need to have a strong strategic case and we have the best chance of success when we have our business leaders who are the experts at securing investment standing shoulder to shoulder with an, um, an executive who has a great ambition for this place. So certainly I think that there is huge opportunities to be had in Northern Ireland and we should have ministers really ambitious for this place leading the charge. Yeah, well, is, is that up to the business leaders to 
to actually put themselves in the driving seat to push that message? Or do we, do we also have to have the politicians involved in that hard sell? Well, I would argue that the business community in Northern Ireland has been driving that case. They have been instrumental. Can they do them on their own? Well, well, they have been doing it on their own. They should not be doing it on their own. And, you know, there's that phrase, uh, we are stronger together. That is absolutely the case in this instance. We should have our business leaders, the people driving innovation, standing shoulder to shoulder with our ministers in a unified ambition for this place so that we can realise the opportunities that are there to be had, opportunities that nowhere else on this planet has. It's a wonderful story, so we really need to have all shoulders at, to the wheel making it happen. And Selena Horshi, you met, um, I think you met the delegation twice, in fact, once up in the northwest and, and, and once in Belfast. Just to pick up on what Nicola Mallon was talking about, that, um, that message about um, dual market access. Did the Americans hear that loud and clear over the past 72 hours? They absolutely did, because it really is our USP at the moment to be able to sit here and look at a region that has access into the EU and the UK is a unique opportunity that many other places would be delighted to have. And that message was very much pushed forward, both by our politicians at the Titanic and also again in Derry in the Guildhall this afternoon. But, but not all politicians, of course, see it that way. I mean, for some politicians, that's controversial and they're opposed to the idea of uh, dual market access. And we can't hide away from that fact. This is true, but what really heartened me was at uh, Titanic this morning, all five of our political leaders took the stage one by one, and each of them talked about the opportunities that were open in Northern Ireland to the US delegation. And I got a glimpse of the growing up politicking that we could have and we deserve to have, as they each individually put forward the case for this place with passion and with precision, and I think that message got across. John, that's very interesting to, to, to hear that. You've been following this story um, for, for BBC News and I very closely over the past couple of days. Um, I mean, do you agree, first of all, that that message is the message that the Americans have been hearing? Yeah, I think, you know, that, that is, as we've heard, the USP that Northern Ireland has at the moment. Though I think, in some ways, what is hard about this is that the dual market access is all about manufacturing. And if you were to cite a manufacturing business, that is a very, very big commitment of capital which is not very easy to back out of. If you're setting up a service business in some ways as, as a, a foreign direct investor, all you need to do really is hire some temporary office space in Belfast. You can start with a very small team and you can start to build out from there. If you're coming here to, to site a factory, you can't work it in that way. You need to make that big capital commitment and therefore you will need to be very comfortable. The arrangements that you are buying into are going to be sustainable and will deliver what you're being told they're going to deliver. And, and at the moment, is it right to say that there is no sign of that level of investment in the area that you're talking about? I, I think when we look at some um, recent manufacturing investments, maybe by people who are already here, the dual market access thing has, has certainly helped. So, for example, this week when Coca-Cola were launching a new line in Lisburn, they did kind of allude to that. But I don't think we've had anybody thus far come out and say front and centre, I'm putting this manufacturing plant here because I have, have dual market access, which I, you know some people would love to see. But again, as Simon was suggesting, a big capital intensive investment like that will probably take you know three, four, five years to actually get it finalised. And, and in some ways, I think where the lack of ministers comes in here is that, again, Simon will know this, that often at the very end of this process, the, the people who are making the decision, they like to be able to speak to the decision makers to give them that extra level of comfort that yes, this thing is going to work, that the door remains open, that, that things can be done. And that is something that you know, obviously we are, we are lacking at the moment. Um Simon, you presumably saw, saw the pictures of the, uh, the Americans um, at Stormont and our local party leaders, four of them at least, um, walking with the delegation down the steps into the Great Hall, giving the illusion, I think I heard somebody <coughs> saying on the radio today, that those politicians are in government together. Well, they're not. They're not at the moment. Does that matter? Does that make a difference, the fact that we do not have a functioning, democratic, accountable, devolved administration in place? Yes, I think it does. Uh, you know, the, some might sort of point to some of the investments that, that, that John has talked about there, referred to, you know, the Almac, the Coca-Cola, even the FDI from Frontline Insurance that was announced this week and say, well, you actually, you, you don't seem to need to have ministers in place to attract that sort of investment. And, you know, that's, that's absolutely right. And, you know, companies continue to invest, new companies continue to, to come to Northern Ireland. But, you know, we've got this USP, as we've referred to it. We've got the talent. We've got that uh, research and development innovation capability that I was referencing earlier. But, you know, without ministers, 
it's a bit like you know, it's a bit like a, a footballer beating a couple of defenders, putting a great cross into the box, but no striker there to put the ball in the net. Uh, and I think you know. Joe Kennedy himself this week has said that to capitalise on the interest that there has been shown this week, to build on that and to really convert that into that sort of long-term investment, I think businesses will want to see stability. Yeah, and I mean, he made that point. I suppose the reality is that while there have been some investments and John's talked about them, you've talked about them, what we don't know is how many other investments potentially could have happened but didn't because there isn't the absolute stability that maybe those companies are looking for. Yeah, and I, and look, and I think, you know, Companies are, are primary, they are companies, they are businesses, they'll be looking to, you know, does this place have the talent that we're looking for? Does it have the skills that we're looking for? Does it have access to the markets that we want to be in? But to, to help to seal that deal, uh, you know, understanding that th this place, which many of them will, will only know because of our, our past and, and the troubles, um, knowing that th those politicians who were there last night at Stormont are actually working together, that are putting their shoulder to the wheel and are, are helping to sell this place and helping to deliver um, to ensure that that investment is a secure one, it's a stable one. That, that's pretty essential moving forward. Yeah, and what the Americans <coughs> who are thinking of investing also want to know is that this is a normal society. We have uh, democratic accountability, we've got stable government. We, we don't just at the moment have that. But they also need to know that we've got a good education system. They need to know that we've got a you know, good health provision, that we have a good cultural well, that, um, life it. in this place, that we've good hospitality sector. That's all terribly important. Well, that's it, exactly. So we know investors have told us that political stability is an important factor in their decision making. But ministers and the assembly should be there to be creating an enabling environment where innovation can flourish, where you are training and equipping people to have the skills to meet the needs of existing and emerging industries. Um, and you can't do that without ministers. Uh, the civil service cannot create that innovative environment. It can't do new things because of the legal constraints within which it operates. So I think that if we could get an executive back, for all of the differences, there is a very single and powerful unifying factor here, which is about growing the economy of Northern Ireland, making sure that our young people have those opportunities, that they're not leaving our shores, making sure that the, the wealth that we can generate can trickle down um, into communities. If I take the logistics and transport industry, which I represent, one of the biggest challenges facing them is decarbonisation. If you look at the transition to electric vehicles, we don't have capacity in the grid. We don't have the charging infrastructure. If you take the big HGVs, there's still no clarity on what the fuel will be. It seems that hydrogen is going to be the solution. But where is the security of supply in terms of hydrogen? Where is the, the fueling infrastructure? These are critical issues. And in the Republic of Ireland, we just heard from Michal, um, the Irish government is given grants and it's given fiscal incentives to the logistics and transport industries to help it transition in Northern Ireland, we don't have anything. So, so are we missing, we are missing um, a trick in that our politicians are focused on other constitutional issues, surprise, surprise, when they should be thinking about the nuts and bolts um, of some of the issues you're talking about, which would be attractive to FDI? Yes, uh, and of course in this place constitutional issues are important, but there's also young people's futures, there's also economic growth, there's also tackling the cost of living, giving people aspiration, opportunities for filling their ambitions. These are all things that we can unify around, and I believe that it's these are issues that you could get an executive very clearly focused on now that we have this, this new momentum behind dual market access. Um, so you work in the hospitality sector, we heard Louise Ward-Hunter there from the Belfast Met talking about this investment. We don't know what the figure is, but investment for training. Training is terribly important as far as hospitality is concerned, as it is for many other sectors, some of which um, Nicola has uh, has referenced there in her comments. Um, does that area make you frustrated that our politicians aren't maybe dealing with that in the way that they could be, should be, as opposed to focusing on the other issues, which are frankly the hoary old chestnuts of life in Northern Ireland? 100%. I think that by not having our executive in place, the challenge of making sure that our young people have the skills to succeed in jobs of now and the jobs of the future is being left purely to our educational institutions who are trying to work on ever cut budgets with very little support. And one of the things that we know is key with FDI is people knowing they have a pipeline of potential workers coming through. And that doesn't matter whether it's a hotel, whether it's advanced manufacturing, the skills need to be taught. So we're really excited and hope that this initial programme supported by the Bank of America is going to be something that potentially could be rolled out in other places because we need to mobilise our economically inactive. If we can do that, we have a young 
we have a workforce, we have a big potential workforce, and all of a sudden, companies who all across the world are struggling for the right skills and the right people will find them here. Um, you, you can speak, I suppose, to some extent about uh, the mood in the northwest because you live there and you know the place very well. I, is it fairly positive at the moment? Because very often we hear you, concerns that the northwest is lagging behind. It's forgotten about compared to investment in the northeast and in Belfast in particular. Are, are you confident that maybe that's changing? There definitely is a change. The very fact that the US delegation came to visit us today in Derry is a really positive sign. The fact that they heard about our unique opportunities, we are used in the Northwest to cross jurisdictional work in. We do it on a day-to-day -day basis. We have those skills and we don't even realize they are skills. And we might only be a city in Derry of 110,000, but we are 600,000 people across a cross-border region who can all work together. And there are big companies, of course, like Fintry, which have invested uh, a lot of money in Derry and created, I think, recently over 300 jobs. They absolutely have. And uh, even today, we had in the delegation some people who have already invested, including the Seagates of the world, who came even before the Good Friday Agreement was, uh, was signed. John, I want to talk to you about Invest NI. Recently yeah. confirmed, of course, it's transforming from a job creation organisation into one focusing on productivity. You made a film for the for the view a number of years ago, focusing on the challenges for productivity in Northern Ireland. Is it fair to say that in the six or seven years since you made that film, very little has actually changed? Yeah, it, it's it, that is the chronic problem in the Northern Ireland economy. So, if, if we think over the last ten years or so, our economy has actually been surprisingly resilient, given the external shocks of, of Brexit, of COVID, um, of Ukraine and the energy crisis. Our economy now is actually bigger than it was before the pandemic. We're some, at something like close to probably technical full employment. So you'd say, well, that, that sounds pretty positive. You look on a much longer time frame, and we've just this chronic problem that our level of, of productivity is just way behind the UK average, way behind the Republic's average, and nothing has really been able to fix that problem. And this isn't just something which you can lay at the door of Stormont. This has been going back like even before the Troubles. Northern Ireland was, was losing its competitive position. And, and it can be quite dispiriting, you know, when you read some of the work, say, for example, that David Jordan at Queen's has done looking at this, where he's saying, well, you look at everything that governments have tried to do to tackle this problem, and nothing has ever worked. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a big difficulty there that has to be tackled. Um, and actually, there's a, a speech that Esmond Burney, the Austrian University economist, was making today saying, you know, you would need an executive which would have a very short programme for government, maybe five points, not pages and pages of stuff. They would agree that before they run to haunt and choose the ministers. And they would absolutely have a real focus on, on driving productivity. Um, and it's not something that InvestNI can do on its own mm. because it's something which is going to be very difficult. And I think also where the politics of it are difficult is it's quite nice as a minister to turn up to say, here I am opening you know, a, a factory, creating a thousand jobs, cutting a ribbon. It's rather less glamorous to say, here are a number of policies which may improve total factor productivity by a fraction of 1% over a 10 year time horizon. The cameras will not really be turning up for that sort of announcement, but those are the sort of things which are going to be very important. Yeah, I, I guess, Simon, this was an issue that you faced when you were in ministerial office in the department um, for the economy. I just wonder if you think your successor, whoever he or she might be, whenever he or she might be in office again, many people would say hopefully sooner rather than later, is that problem going to be just exactly the same as it was when it was sitting on your desk? Yeah, I think it, look, John has, has summarised the, the, the challenge for for politicians who tend to focus and operate in short electoral cycles, uh, and particularly in our system where you know you may get into a into a department and you may only have a couple of years, you know, five years at most, uh, and, and that's, annual budgets as well, Simon. Uh, uh, yeah, and it, and it's incredibly hard to turn around what has been an intergenerational challenge in a five-year assembly term. So it does start, as as John has has mentioned there, with. The executive setting it as a priority and saying that this will be a multi-mandate challenge. Um, it is problematic in terms, and there, there are huge opportunities in terms of AI, automation, uh, technology to, to really drive productivity. Um, it does present a potential challenge in terms of if that then starts to, to put people out of work, then that's not necessarily popular um, politically either. Does so that worry you? So there's Do you well, think that is a problem well, coming no, down no, the tracks? Well, I, I, think, I think in the long term, people probably said this about every single technological, massive technological innovation that there has been in, in human history, that it would have um, an impact on jobs, but yet there's always new jobs that are created by that. But you know, in the short term, there could, be, there could be challenges in that front. But that's why you need an executive in place working alongside our universities, working alongside industry to ensure that there are opportunities for everybody 
whilst we drive productivity up. Um, and a key part of that has to be what, tackling the siloed approach within government and across the civil service. Like the economy is not just the responsibility of the economy minister. You know, the infrastructure minister is, your infrastructure is a key enabler of the economy. So if we get an executive back, hopefully when we get an executive back, that siloed approach needs to be broken down and there needs to be cross-departmental working. And we also need to have better partnership working with the private sector. We should open up the civil service to independent secondments. Um, we have a lot to learn that would bring in fresh thinking. It would be very helpful, constructive, critical challenge in government. So there are things that we can do. But if we continue doing what we've always done, we're going to end up getting the same results. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, Mark, Nicholas Ray, because you know, the, the, the quantum of the challenges that we are facing now, whether it's, it's climate change or whether it is the, you know, the potential of AI or indeed the challenges of, of automation and, and technology, you know, business often has the answers. But yet we can't have a closed shop mentality in government, which doesn't allow that sort of expertise and knowledge to, to penetrate and, and to help all of us in the longer term. Yeah, I, I wonder, Selena, are you optimistic about the return of politicians? Because on last week's programme, we were discussing the extent to which having politicians back in office might get in the way of essential transformation as far as the health service here is concerned. Um, you do hear sometimes people putting forward the argument that um, there's a similar issue as far as the economy is concerned, because our politicians could make a bad situation worse if they come back and bicker between themselves and promote only their pet projects. Well, you want to hope that what we're going to have, and I hope, I'm optimistic that it will come back, I'm hopeful at least, um, is politics that are going to look at the real future of this area, where people are going to collaborate. I think they can actually learn from business because business is succeeding at the minute on its own without that support. But that success rate could be increased because at the end of the day, the prosperity that should have come hand in hand with peace did not follow. And so businesses are individually trying to push that forward. There are levers that only the government can pull. Levers that could make a big difference. And some of them are big, big issues. Things like corporation tax could be changed through the executive if that was the route that was decided to go down, which could suddenly make us much more competitive with the Republic of Ireland and enhance our competitivity against the rest of the UK. So those are big, big levers that only the government can pull. So absolutely, we don't want to see people just doing their own pet projects, but we do need people that we can lobby, that we can discuss this with, so that if they take the business opinions on board, we can really drive this place forward. Can I just ask you, Nicola, we've talked about dual market access. Um, you're obviously working in the logistics sector at the moment. As far as the green and red lanes are concerned, that there's so much talk about, could you just tell us how you think they're working out at the moment? Is it is it OK or is it as bad as some people say it is? Well, I think if you're looking at the operation of the green lane from the 1st of October, um, no major issues have arisen, but there are particular challenges for some business models. So, for example, if your business is picking up different loads in GB and then bringing them, dropping them off, in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, well, really, your lorry is only going to move as, as slow as your red lane goods, even if you're carrying green lane. There's also issues about it being like quite bureau bureaucratic. But look, we need to work through these things. But again, it's a point that we've been making right around this table. Government needs to work with the experts. The experts are the private sector, the people who are moving the goods. And so it's really important when we have the second wave of changes coming in, affecting parcels, that government road tests things with industry. OK, um, I think we've just really scratched the surface, but it's a really interesting conversation. Um, thank you all very much indeed for coming in to join us on the programme today.